It's the highlight of the year for diabetes professionals around the world, providing the very latest cutting edge advances in diabetes research, prevention, and care. This is the 81st American Diabetes Association Scientific Sessions, and you're watching ADA TV. Welcome back for our third show and Sunday at the 81st Scientific Sessions. It's a big day with the presentation of the Banting Medal. We'll be interviewing Dr. Jens Yul Hulst later in the show. The body has a, ca a capability of, of curing, more or less, both diabetes and obesity. And in honor of his pioneering discoveries, we'll look at some of the research being done today, examining new modes of action and potential new diabetes therapies. I hope that we can inspire uh, basic researchers to investigate this field more, to unravel more. Then we could actually make a real difference for these people. We'll also catch up with Kelly West Award recipient, Dr. Nicholas Wareham, direct from Cambridge. We've moved away from thinking about the problem as being one of lifestyle to thinking about behaviors in a broader sense, because they're often beyond the control of individuals. You'll find us at the front page of the meeting platform on the ADA website, and on YouTube and Twitter. Now, it's back to Donna DeBalia, chair of the Scientific Sessions Meeting Planning Committee for some of Sunday's must-see events. Welcome back to the ADA's 81st Scientific Sessions. It is now the third day of the meeting, and by now, I hope that you're fully familiar with the format and enjoying the content of our sessions. The centerpiece for today is the President of Medicine and Science Address, delivered this year by Dr. Ruth Weinstock at 1015, who will look back at how our accomplishments are guiding our steps today and inform on the goals for the future. Her address is immediately followed by the ADA's Banting Medal for Scientific Achievement Lecture, this year by Dr. Jens Yule Holst from the University of Copenhagen. Dr. Holst will talk about his lifetime work and his great scientific achievement, the discovery of the glucagon-like peptide 1 and its use in diabetes care. Then at 2.15, you're in for another treat, the Kelly West Award for Outstanding Achievement in Epidemiology Lecture, delivered by Dr. Nicholas Wareham from the University of Cambridge. Dr. Wareham will talk about what we know of risk factors for type 2 diabetes based on large observational studies, but also what we need to do in real life to prevent type 2 diabetes. We end the day with the year in review, which will highlight the past year's achievements in basic, translational, and clinical sciences. I hope that you will find these and the many more planned sessions informative, relevant to your practice, and enjoyable. See you all tomorrow. Lots to look out for today at the meeting. Still to come, we've got Dr. Jens Yule Hulse and Dr. Nicholas Wareham talking about the game-changing, award-winning work. But now, in our first feature for the day, let's go to Vertex, a company using cell therapy to replace the lost insulin-producing cells in type 1 diabetes patients. I was trained as a, what's called a developmental biologist, and my lab studied how a fertilized egg makes an animal. When our second child, Sam, was born, he didn't seem quite right, but at uh, six months, so still as an infant, he was uh, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I did what any parent would do. I, when your child is diagnosed with a serious disease, you say, what am I going to do about it? After I learned about the disease, I discovered that for, you know, 90 some years, people had been injecting insulin and trying to figure out how much insulin to inject by measuring the amount of sugar in their blood. And as a biologist, I thought, well, if in the disease, the problem is a cell is missing, why are we just trying mechanically to reproduce what that cell does? Can't we replace the cells? 
be sure to visit our virtual exhibitors. You can connect with them and see all the latest information on the services and products they provide. You can also participate in our industry learning hub and take part in a range of exciting learning opportunities. Next up, it's Akiro Therapeutics. Using an FGF21 analog, they're working on a NASH therapy that could potentially reverse liver fibrosis as well as reduce insulin resistance. NASH stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, the most common liver disease in the United States and now even throughout the world. These are patients that are very insulin resistant, which is at the core of the pathogenesis of fatty liver disease. It really needs multifactorial approaches to its treatment. FGF21 is this extraordinary natural hormone. We believe it has really the potential to address all of these core drivers of NASH pathology. We've been working with Akira for the past two years with the start of the BALANCE study. The BALANCE study was a 2A trial with a fruxifermin, an engineered FGF21 analog. Many patients have two-stage improvement in fibrosis over this 16-week period. What we saw in those patients was a significant reduction in hemoglobin A1C. This is the first opportunity that I've had of hopefully getting a treatment. Coming up, we'll catch up with Banting Medal winner Dr. Jens Juhl Hulse, direct from Copenhagen. But first, a Swedish company inspired by his work, Pila Pharma, is working on an agonist for TRPV1, otherwise known as the Chili Receptor. Pila Pharma are focused on the TRPV1 sensors found in insulin sensitive tissue. In my PhD work, I suddenly stumbled over that TRPV1 may have a role in diabetes, and it has never let go of me, me since. They hypothesize that inflammatory cells in obese tissue can activate TRPV1, triggering a vicious cycle of pathogenesis. Pila Pharma is currently at phase two on a novel TRPV1 antagonist to block this cycle. A clinical study where the administration of the antagonist from Pila Pharma has actually resulted in an increased insulin response in, in people. It seems to be not just targeting blood glucose levels, but also has anti-inflammatory actions. This is a completely novel mechanism of action. With this molecule, if we get all the way to the market, and I hope so, then we could actually make a real difference for these people. The more you participate, the more you could win. You'll receive points for each area you visit on the site. So, the more active you are, the more points you'll earn. The attendee who earns the most points will receive complimentary meeting registration to next year's meeting. It is my great pleasure now to be joined by Dr. Jens Juhl Holst, the 2021 Banting Medal for Scientific Achievement recipient. Thanks so much for joining us. Congratulations on the honor. You played a major role in some of the earliest research into the gut hormones that we now know play a huge part in diabetes. So what drove you to undertake that research and what do you feel was your most satisfying achievement? I, as I, I was trained uh, as, a, as a surgeon when I was a young doctor, and um, uh, I was in gastrointestinal surgery, and I was very interested in this. And uh, we had some problems in the department with people who developed reactive hypoglycemia. In both cases, we had the suspicion that something from the gut would um, either cause the hypoglycemia, and it took about 25 years, and then we got the answer. It was this new hormone, GLP-1, that was responsible for this. Can you tell us a bit about the work you're doing today? What are you learning from bariatric surgery, and how might this translate into non-surgical interventions? So one of the interesting things, the, the lessons we learned from bariatric surgery is that the body has a, a capability of, of curing, more or less, both diabetes and obesity. The problem was to identify the mechanisms, first of all, and we, I guess we have done that by studying the effects of these hormones, GLP-1 and also PYY. And the next is then to understand why they are hypersecreted. And if we can understand that completely, then perhaps we can stimulate the body's own uh, secretion of these hormones to get the same results as we get with bariatric surgery, but without surgery. So give us a preview of your talk at the meeting. Why should people stop by to listen? First of all, I hope that it's uh, just a little bit entertaining, I hope. So I guess the, the awareness of the Incretin effect and, and um, 
and the and the extensions of our uh, learnings from this uh, into uh, modern therapy are the important things that we uh, that I would like to to uh, convey in in that lecture. That I hope that was uh, possible. Thank you so much, and best of luck for the future. Each year, the ADA recognizes the outstanding contributions of individuals in the service of the diabetes community through its National Scientific and Healthcare Achievement Awards and Professional Interest Group Awards. Find out much more about each recipient on the award winners page. Inspiring work from Dr. Jens Yul Holst. Now to Pittsburgh, where UPMC Children's Hospital is collaborating with Genprex on a new gene therapy approach to both type 1 and type 2 diabetes treatment. What most type 1 diabetics are shocked by when they hear it is that this therapy will basically make them completely normal. Yeah, it's actually really cool how kind of simple biologically it is. So what happens is we engineer this virus that has the, the DNA blueprint for how to make insulin. We then direct that virus specifically at alpha cells into the pancreas, which are the sibling cells to beta cells, which naturally produce insulin and are lost in type 1 diabetes. So when this virus specifically binds to the alpha cell, it does what it's evolutionarily done for a thousand years, inserts its DNA, but instead of the viral genome, the viral DNA, it inserts the blueprint for how to make insulin. From there, that alpha cell, which is already naturally in the environment for making insulin, is converted to a cell that now makes insulin. Cures type 1 diabetes. Let's head to Belgium now, where Imsys is working closely with clinicians to bring a new kind of therapy aimed at intervening in immune-mediated diseases to patients, starting with diabetes. Immotopes are basically modified naturally occurring epitopes derived from autoantigens that are responsible for autoimmune disorder that are then able to kill the part of the immune system that is responsible for these autoimmune diseases. We hope to really refine their treatment into a very efficacious and safe treatment for people with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes. At Insights, we have assembled a group of very talented individuals that are working relentlessly day and night to really develop these molecules into products for patients. Need a break? Take part in one or all of the meeting's well-being activities, including the 5K at ADA Virtual Challenge and the Daily Mystery Diagnosis. Or take a five-minute break to get your body moving and visit the interactive world map to see where you and your colleagues from around the world are attending from. Still to come, an interview with Kelly West Award recipient Dr. Nicholas Wareham. Stand by for that. But first to VTV Therapeutics. They're working on a molecule for an insulin-independent therapy for type 1 diabetes. VTV Therapeutics is a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company developing small molecules for large therapeutic areas. Our lead candidates are in type 1 diabetes and in Alzheimer's. And importantly, these are all drug candidates that we discovered in our laboratories. Roughly 1.6 million people in the United States of America and many more around the world suffer from type 1 diabetes, a truly burdensome disease that affects one throughout their lifetime. The majority of patients with diabetes do not achieve the treatment goals defined by the American Diabetes Association. TTP399 is a new compound that works in the liver um, and with regards to blood sugar, it increases the amount of uh, glucose that's taken up by the liver, particularly after meals. TTP399 has the potential to be the perfect adjunctive therapy to insulin. Before we get to our final interview of the day, it's time for our final feature 
let's visit Applied Therapeutics, where research is focused on designing treatments for indications with significant unmet medical needs, including diabetic cardiomyopathy. Applied Therapeutics is a clinical stage pharmaceutical company leveraging new technology to target metabolic diseases such as diabetic cardiomyopathy. Diabetic cardiomyopathy is a form of stage B heart failure. Up to one in five diabetic patients have diabetic cardiomyopathy. This underscores the need for new therapies specifically targeting the underlying metabolic pathway implicated in the disease. 8001 is a novel aldose reductase inhibitor. Study demonstrated that T001 normalized sorbitol from high toxic levels seen in patients with diabetes to the level that are seen in patients who don't have diabetes. In addition, 50% of patients showed a substantial reduction of nt BMP, a cardiac stress biomarker, within just 28 days. It has the potential to be the first treatment for patients with diabetic cardiomyopathy. I'm now joined by Dr. Nicholas Wareham, recipient of the 2021 Kelly West Award for Outstanding Achievement in Epidemiology. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. What first got you interested in understanding the etiology of diabetes and other metabolic diseases? I've been involved in diabetes clinically in the late 80s, but uh, encountered research in the early 90s and was really fascinated by what was it about physical inactivity that was associated with diabetes and, and, and gave people uh, increased risk. And really identifying the key elements so that we could actually inform prevention. What were some of your most rewarding early accomplishments? Well, I was very fortunate. I worked uh, as part of a cohort study in the UK in the early 90s and was able to employ an objective method to separate out the effects of physical activity and fitness and really work out that it was what we should be striving for is to try and increase overall physical activity in everyone. How have you seen our understanding of the role of lifestyle exposure and gene environment interactions change over the years? You can see diabetes as a, a clinical manifestation of a pathophysiological problem, or you can see it as a uh, public health manifestation of a societal problem. And I think we've moved away from thinking about the problem as being one of lifestyle, which uh, intrinsically got a sense that there was an issue of choice, to thinking about behaviors in a broader sense and trying to work out what the key determinants of those behaviors are, because they're often beyond the control of individuals. Share with us now a little bit about your talk at the meeting. What can attendees expect? In my talk uh, at the meeting really traces the uh, change in our knowledge about risk factors and type 2 diabetes, harking back to early research in the 1970s, which really was qualitative and established what the risk factors for diabetes were. And over the last 40 years, we and others have uh, assembled evidence that goes into much greater depth about what those relationships are, how quantitative they are, and, and whether or not they are causal. And it's this that uh, allows that epidemiological knowledge to be translated into preventive action. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Make sure to catch that presentation today. That's all from us for Sunday, but you can still click through for extended versions of all of our content and find us on the meeting platform on the ADA website and on YouTube and Twitter. Tomorrow, we'll catch up with Dr. Kristin Nadiu, Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award recipient, and focus on the gut, from the microbiome to nutrition, and new non-surgical interventions. Make sure to join us again. <laughs>